Uh, so the agenda of this, we're going to go through a number of different topics, look at a, a number of different capabilities within the Microsoft Cloud. So Microsoft Cloud being Office 365, Azure AD. Uh, basically, how are attackers going after the cloud? What are the capabilities that they're taking advantage of or, or uh, uh, leveraging in order to be successful in what they're doing? The security controls, auditing, administration, controlling that access, uh, gaining better insight into passwords, how users are authenticating, and what can we do to actually tune up our cloud security, and how can we test those defenses in a way that makes sense without um, running hacking tools all over the place? And then the Office 365 subscriptions and the capabilities that we get with those subscriptions. Uh, what are the things that we want, need to look at as a baseline level of this is what we need to be secure, or at least start that journey of security in the, in the cloud. So Microsoft has been quite successful uh, in getting cloud services out there to the world. I mean, this is information from Microsoft Ignite Conference in September. So 17.5 million organizations, 1.1 uh, billion identities, and 90% of the Fortune 500 companies have Azure Active Directory in, in use. Uh, those are really big numbers. And these numbers have just gradually increased over the past few years as I've been tracking this. And it's going to get bigger. And so as I looked at what Microsoft was doing, and this is primarily a talk about the Microsoft Cloud, obviously. I had conversations with people recently about what is the cloud and what does cloud security actually mean? And the person told me this, this quote that they heard from a vendor. The cloud is more secure since the vendor spends millions every year on cloud security. In some case, in cases, a billion dollars. Now, does that translate to security? I don't necessarily think so. And then I started digging in, having more conversations with this person about what that actually means. What is this investment in cloud security? Well, certainly that's cloud infrastructure. So what the cloud is, how we connect to it, all of the back-end components to it, and the capabilities of it, security controls, which vary from cloud vendor to cloud vendor. So how do we know that cloud is secure? When I sign up for Microsoft Office 365, when I go to the Google platform, uh, maybe, when I go to Amazon AWS, what does that mean? What does the security of that platform mean? How is that working for me? Well, we're looking at the infrastructure. This conversation on the, on the screen right now is about the cloud infrastructure. Okay, sure, absolutely. I believe that Office 365 is gonna do a better job of securing Exchange than a lot of organizations are. Okay, fine, fair point. But what about the way that people access it? What about the authentication? What about the controls around that? Because when we're talking about our networks, our internal corporate networks, uh, this is something we're very familiar with. In, in some cases, we've had a couple of decades to figure it out and to really understand it. And the cloud paradigm is very different. It changes from we have perimeter network, we have perimeter controls, we have perimeter security, we have VPNs to control access. Once someone is on the network, uh, they've gone through some process to get there, be they authorized or unauthorized. When we're talking about the cloud, it's open to the internet. So pretty much anyone on the internet could connect to it potentially and access our, our cloud environment, our cloud resources, our cloud data. So, how do we make this transition in a way that makes sense? How do we go from our on-prem environment that we understand really well to a cloud environment that is quite honestly changing every six months or so or more rapidly? Anyone who's in Office 365, as I am, gets the emails almost weekly saying this change, this change, this change. And it's daunting. Because realistically, the attackers love the cloud as well. Microsoft says 81% of data breaches involve weak default or stolen passwords, and they said that they blocked in August, just one month, 1 1.29 billion authentications that were believed to be malicious. Because people are still using bad passwords, of course. It all starts with the password, which is one of the reasons why Microsoft is pushing so hard to this passwordless uh, type concept. There are controls that we can add to this to, to better protect our environment, to protect this authentication, and know that when a user is authenticating, it is that person that chose password 1234 and not someone else that was like, I think their password is password 1234. Because the threat is real, and it's getting more real all the time. In fact, this year, Microsoft has published some really strong numbers that show how dangerous it is to have a cloud environment with just username and password for our users especially given the bad passwords that users often select. And this year in March, US CERT put out a, a bulletin saying that brute force attacks are being conducted by cyber actors. 
This isn't just on-prem. This is also against the cloud. They're taking a list of passwords. They're attempting those passwords, uh, attempting to authenticate with those passwords against the cloud environment, against that on-prem environment, in order to identify and, and discover credentials that they could leverage to do malicious activities. And at Ignite, Microsoft put up this great slide here that shows what the attack timeline looks, look, looks like, so I figured I'd reuse it. And so it starts with the attacker guessing and compromising that initial credential. The initial credential could be a user account, and once they have that, they can perform recon just like they can on-prem, and gather information about other users in the environment and identify who potentially the admins are. But if they compromise a privileged credential because that user has a bad password, it happens all the time, and doesn't have MFA configured, well, then they have some very interesting things that they can do. Now the attacker can, can identify what sort of access they have. They can scan and look for mailboxes in the environment that they may have access to. And if this happens to be an administrative account, very often it's going to have some Exchange Online capabilities. And so at that point, they can scan through using uh, open source tools like MailSniper to then identify and even extract that data pretty easily from those mailboxes that they find. The other thing that's very interesting is for the organizations that are taking their password hashes and syncing them up to the Azure AD cloud, if they have bad passwords on-prem in their AD environment, those bad passwords just get added and updated within the Azure AD environment, which means if they're using password 1234 on-prem, password 1234 is now their Azure AD account password. And the attacker is guessing that today. If there's no MFA required, well, that attacker knows what that credential is. They can leverage that credential. And then, as we can see in a number four at the bottom, the attacker is using this stolen credential to then VPN into the corporate environment. So this is a way that attackers today are identifying what your on-prem user accounts and passwords are, and then connecting in to then perform recon and looking for other additional information. So it starts with protecting our credentials, obviously. Well, what does this look like? So I ran a password spray attack against my test tenant and using OWA, so outlook.office365.com slash OWA, open for everyone um, unless you have additional controls and protections in place. Most, by default, do not. So OWA did not work the way I thought it would. So I said, okay, well, this is going to be really awful because I have this presentation and I'm not going to be able to show what I want to show. Uh, but there's this other thing called EWS. And by default, EWS, Exchange Web Services, is available for all users in the Office 365 environment which is interesting because EWS has started as the, here's how you can programmatically interact with a mailbox. Uh, you can write code. You can have it, uh, you can build effectively your own Outlook because who wouldn't want to build Outlook all over again, right? But there's other capability here. Bulk transfer, store search, uh, service configuration synchronization, message tracking, inbox rules. So attackers can leverage the inbox rules in order to provide an, an interesting uh, persistence method where they can add rules to a mailbox they can send an email to that mailbox, that mail rule will process it, and can even extract and send data from that mailbox out or install or run code on that system. So with EWS, I went ahead and ran it, it connected fine, and it went through, and I was able to guess passwords. Now this is your standard out of the box Office 365 tenant with nothing really special about it. The users have bad passwords here, summer 2018, uh, with an exclamation point because they want it to be more secure, uh, password 99, et cetera. So I want to look at one of these specifically, and we're going to look at Leia. So I tend to use Star Wars type characters in my demo. So Princess Leia had a pa bad password here because she was given bad advice. And uh, so there's a bad password. It was compromised. And so when we look at the sign-in logs in Azure AD, we can see that at the top that Leia was successfully authenticated. And if we look at the bottom, we can see that there was a failure. So from the failure at the 11th second to the success at the 29th second, that means that uh, it took 18 seconds until it cycled back, th back through to do this. I wrote this PowerShell script to do this uh, password spraying against Office 365. I don't know. It took me like 15 minutes. Um, it was very easy to use. I just used the Mail Sniper uh, PowerShell module off of, off of GitHub. And so once I had that, once I built a password list, once I had a list of users, I could target this and go ahead and run it. And it was very successful. 
And so when I look at the success here, I see client app, other clients, older office clients. So that's going to be key as I'm talking about it a little bit later, but those in the audience in the know are saying, okay, conditional access, we will have a conversation about that. In fact, Joe Kaplan is having a conversation about conditional access right now next door. So this is the success. We can see where the IP address is coming from. We can see the geo information. We have some additional information that we can get. If there was a device used, we could click on device info and see what that was. If there was MFA required, we could look at that as well. But the failure here is going to say invalid user or password combination, and it's coming from the same location. So maybe Leia mis misconfigured or, or typed in her password incorrectly, and it just didn't work out. It's possible. It's possible. But when we look at all of these sign-ins, we see that there's a number of failures for a bunch of different accounts at about the same time. This is highly suspicious. And if we dig into this even further, we add another column here that gives us the IP address. We add another column here that shows us the client app. We're going to notice the IP address is the same. I actually use an Azure VM to, to run this, so that that's why the bottom here you can see this is coming from Microsoft. So from the perspective of cloud security controls, there are a number of things that we can do to help uh, solve this problem, or at least figure out a better way to deal with it. And in Azure Active Directory, when you go in and look at the dashboard, there's all these different items. And again, it can be quite daunting when you look at this. But if you look down in this bottom corner, there's some other capabilities that we're going to dig into right now. And one of them is called Azure Identity Protection. Uh, it's included with Azure AD Premium. The thing that annoys me about this is you actually have to install it via the Azure Marketplace, via portal.azure.com. So to me, this is a bit confusing because I'm in my Azure AD console within Office 365. I don't see anything about Azure Identity Protection. I then have to bounce over to portal.azure.com and go into there to then install it. And then once I do that by searching for it, because I'm not going to just automatically find it, because Microsoft's not going to surface that for me and say that I have it. Uh, so once I find that, I have some uh, ability to look to see what identity risk is there. I can see that there's, automatic, uh, there's ways to perform some automatic remediation of risky sign-ins. And so what does that actually mean, uh, risky? We'll, we'll look at that in a second. But this is just a, a snapshot of Microsoft's graphic uh, of what this looks like as far as having a number of users that are coming in that are risky uh, and what that might look like. So when we're talking about risk-based policies, again, we're using the Azure Identity Protection, which you need Azure AD Premium P1 or P2 for. So that's an additional subscription beyond what you have in Office 365, uh, probably. It does assign a risk level during sign-in, and it assigns it either a low level of risk, a medium level, or a high level of risk. And so this risk level determines some uh, action that's there. So if you think of this as a conditional access light, just based on the sign-in level of risk, and of course, conditional access has more capability around uh, risk and, and how to handle that. But we can force a password change uh, if we're configured as such. We can require MFA registration, which we definitely want all our users to have already gone through that process, so that's been handled. And even better, if Azure AD identifies that there is something unusual about this authentication, through this, we can force an MFA. So that way, if someone is attempting a password spray, we can stop the password spray and say, I'm not really certain that this is the user, this is the user that owns this account. I'm going to force them to MFA to come in for this when I normally do not. And so setting up these policies is actually very straightforward. Uh, we can set up a sign-in risk policy. There's a sign-in risk policy and a user risk remediation policy. So these are a little bit confusing as far as the naming goes. Uh, so I'll break this into two different components. Uh, the sign-in risk policy is, is this a risky sign-in? Is there something unusual about this specific sign-in that we don't normally see that we want to make sure that we have some additional protection around uh, or some other concerns? So Microsoft says, if it's an anonymous IP, maybe it's coming from a, a, a one of the uh, VPNs that are available on the internet or an unfamiliar location. I'm in New York today. I'm going to be in California next week or, or whatever. I was in DC yesterday. W what does that look like? How is that handled? So I can go through and create this policy. I can apply it to all users or specific users or a user group. I can set the sign-in risk. Here I say medium and above. And here I'm in this one, in this instance, I'm saying if this is a risky sign-on or something that looks unusual about it, I want to make sure that this user is forced to, to MFA for this authentication. And then the nice thing about this is I can configure the policy and I can leave it off. And this bottom part here that says review, number of sign-ins impacted, I can actually look at it to figure out who might be impacted by this. 
and so that gives me an idea. So if I see that my uh, executive is going to be impacted by this, I might want to exclude them from it from, from when I'm first setting it up. Uh, and then, of course, have a conversation about what this actually means and why it's important. So from the risky sign-on to the risk and remediation. So this is more about, is this account compromised? Is there activity around this account that looks like someone may actually have the credentials for this account, but it, is, it has been breached? And so Microsoft can do some detection in real time around this. Uh, there's some other components that require about a two-week learning period. So if you're familiar with user behavior analysis, it's kind of that with machine learning and other buzzword of the week. So here we can configure the same, same sort of policy. It's very easy to do, same sort of setup, except for the control here, we're going to require a password change. We think that this, we have very high level of certitude that this account has been compromised, so we're going to force a password change through, the, through a, uh, an authentication that is, is a, uh, when the user authenticates through a method that is not very risky, we can force them to change their password. We can block the account as well if we need to. So Microsoft notes that there's a couple of limitations to this. Um, the big one is that if you see at the bottom, this is for modern authentication. And it's not applied to applications using older security protocols. So there's some limitations around this that we just can't fix with just Azure Identity Protection. So when we have a system, it's important that we focus on some of the core security elements of that system, and one of which is auditing, of course. We want to make sure that when things happen, it gets logged, we can go back and look at it. All right, that sounds very straightforward. However, with the cloud, not everything is quite straightforward. There's different elements of auditing. So we have user and admin activity auditing uh, in the Office 365 Security and Compliance Center. These are not turned on by default. You have to go in and actually click on it, uh, which I don't like, but Microsoft says they're working on it. Just like that, mailbox auditing is not enabled by default. Microsoft announced in June that they are changing this and they are gradually going through and updating tenants so that this mailbox auditing is enabled by default. In my tenant that I created in the past 60 days, it was not enabled. So I had to go through and enable it. And then there's other types of auditing that you get depending on your subscription model or uh, depending, it's, auditing is configured but you have different, different uh, log retentions, which is important to know because you may want to be checking your risk, users at risk and risky sign-ons, but if you have your standard level of Azure AD, which you have with your Office 365 subscription, you're only going to get seven days of that. You're not going to be able to see beyond it. And with Azure AD P1, you get 30 days. With Azure AD P2, you're going to get 90 days. Uh, so there's some difference uh, in the way that auditing is configured, the logs that you can look at, how long you can look at them, as well as if they're configured depending on what you have. Sign-on activity, you're only going to get with Azure AD P1. So you're going to have to pay to see uh, that sign-on activity information. So there's these different components. Important to, to have the information about what's available to you. And then when you are configuring your SIM or a tool that's going to have your, uh, the logs go to it, what you're actually going to get and what you're going to see in that. So P2 doesn't do uh, sign-on activity? I, it does. Sorry, that, that was a, this starts with P1. So P, P1 slash P2, you can just imagine it says that. That would be silly, wouldn't it? Um, <laughs> That's what I was <laughs> right. So uh, we want to enable user and admin activity auditing. Uh, you go to the page, it very helpfully says, click the, here to turn on activity auditing. Uh, I would love this to just be automatic as soon as you set up your tenant. That way we have this information without having to go in and explicitly do it. Um, most of the, the customers that we worked with already have this enabled. Uh, but if you are just going to Office 365, this can be something that you know, is not well known or not well understood. We click on it. It says that it's going to take a couple of hours before this is fully enabled and you have data, which makes sense. Mailbox auditing. So we have to use PowerShell to do this. We can use Get Mailbox in order to get the information about it and the auditing. Again, new tenant, uh, no auditing configured. So we're going to run a PowerShell script that's going to get a list of the mailboxes in the environment and then it's, we're going to tell it to configure auditing and set it in that environment. And once we do that, it's set to true, and we have all of our mailbox audited. But what happens when we migrate in new mailboxes? They don't have mailbox auditing on it. Mailbox auditing is critical in order to understand if there's a breach scenario or if there's a problem where an account has been compromised, especially an Exchange admin account. Very often, we've worked with customers that don't have admin accounts in the cloud uh, that are just username and password. So we want to make sure that these admin accounts very much all the time require MFA. B 
because once one of those accounts is compromised, they can get in, they can change permissions on these mailboxes. Uh, they can have backdoor access to the mailboxes, even if that account has been removed. Uh, it's, it's happened where uh, attackers have gotten access to a system, they have changed the permissions on mailboxes of interest in the environment, and then when they lost access to that admin account, they used a regular user account in that environment they were able to compromise also. And then with that user account, they were able to continue to exfiltrate data from that mailbox. So without mailbox auditing configured, you are not going to see any of this activity. You're going to see the authentication, but you're not necessarily going to see what's happening behind that. So it's very important to have this configured. And Microsoft has added uh, in preview log analytics, uh, which provides capability to ingest this Azure AD data so you can see what's going on in your environment. Uh, this is similar to, uh, uh, if you call it kind of a cloud splunk uh, from Microsoft's perspective. Uh, the queries look kind of similar to that. Their, their data ingestion model and pricing is, is now similar to Splunk as well, where it's the amount of data that's going into it is what you actually pay for. So something to look at, especially since it's in preview. So that's auditing. The other part of this that's really important and critically important is administration. We want to make sure that our administrators are well protected. And as I mentioned, we want to make sure that MFA is required for all of our cloud administrators. It's kind of a tough ask because for years our administrators have been working with username and password. And now we're saying, all right, in the cloud you have to use MFA. And we can identify and look at the information about who the administrators are that, that don't have MFA configured, especially if we're using a standard naming standard, standard naming standard. We want to make sure that we know who the administrators are, that we require MFA, and then on top of that, that we're looking to see what the MFA methods are. Because by default, text message and SMS is part of that MFA story. So ideally, we want to ensure that the Authenticator app is the primary method that's used. Or if you're using a third party uh, MFA provider or, or second factor, that we're using that and that's what's enforced. Because when we're talking about access to the system, this, or access to the system by a privileged account, we want to make sure that that is the person who's trying to access it and that we can guarantee that it is. So there's, we can look at the logs, we can identify how the account connected, the MFA that was used. We can see if it was SMS or if it was the standard MFA. I did a talk at Black Hat and DEF CON this year about basically hacking administrators and administrator accounts. And key to this was figuring out ways to get around MFA in the way that it works. So for example, if, if Authenticator is the primary method where they have to go to the app and look at the code that's on it, well, they're not going to get any kind of notification if someone is going in to, to uh, request authentication. So ideally, we're going to have Authenticator configured and the MFA configured where they're going to get a push where it says accept or deny. That way, there's a signal to the actual user, the owner of the account, when someone is trying to do something that's unusual. Uh, otherwise, it's possible for someone to try to go and just say, OK, send me a text message. And we know that there's a number of different ways that if there's a target attack against an organization, there's ways to get access to text messages. There's ways to redirect the cellular network. So the other thing that's very important, and I, uh, it was mentioned by Pamela earlier, I believe, when talking about ensuring there's a break glass uh, cloud admin account. Very, very important. Make sure that you have an admin account. Create this admin account. Give it a very strong, completely random password that goes into a safe, and don't ever use it, except when you then lock er yourself out of everything. Because one of the problems with security controls is it's very easy to lock yourself out of that which you need access to. What's one of the big reasons that people push back on encryption? Well, what if I forget my key, or what if this happens and then I can't get access to my data, right? Thankfully, BitLocker, TPM, and a lot of other things have, have commoditized encryption, so it's a lot easier for us to work with it now. But it's the same sort of scenario with this break glass cloud admin account. If we have a cloud admin account and or let's say we don't have a break glass cloud admin account, and we set up conditional access rules across the whole environment for every user, and they have to MFA, and they have to connect from the corporate network, and they have to do all these other things. But we make a mistake, and we flub something in the conditional access policy. Now, everyone who is, has that privileged access is blocked and cannot get into the system. Well, that means we're going to have to call Microsoft, and somehow we're going to have to figure out a way out of this. And I don't know that that's always going to be an easy thing. Yes, Uh, 
Uh, nothing. So th this is the free way to do it. Obviously, conditional access requires Azure AD pre uh, Premium. So, uh, and that's just a sh uh, sample script that I wrote. So it's not it's not the the let's say the the uh, official or best way to do it either. So, uh, great question. So we want to make sure that there are. are Break glass cloud admin account is, is well protected, but at the same time is available to be used in case we lock ourselves out of everything else. Because I don't know what the process is with Microsoft to actually get access and r remove this conditional access configuration, but I imagine it's quite arduous and not the simplest thing to do. So as a, in a discussion about administration and uh, protecting administration in, Active Directory, in Azure Active Directory, uh, we have to talk about Azure AD privilege identity management. Uh, which is part of Azure AD Premium 2, uh, which means that there's a cost associated with it. One of the best things about PIM here is that the whole concept of it is the, the thing that's been discussed in, in the industry for a number of years now, which is you're here at a conference. Um, some of you have your laptops open, but hopefully no one is, is having to do like real work and fix things and, and move users around and do administrative type work. Or when we go on vacation, we, we, we shouldn't have to be doing any work while we're there, uh, hopefully. And so we can actually enjoy our vacation. But the concept of administration has always been this thing where I'm a member of an admin group. I'm a member of multiple admin groups. So I'm an administrator because my account is a member of these groups. But if I don't require that, those rights all the time, then why do I always have them? It's just this concept has been continued for many years because we didn't really have necessarily a better way to do it. So this whole concept of just-in-time or, or controlling access or, or temporal administration is where we, our, our admin account is not a member of these highly privileged groups until they need to be. And then there's a workflow around that. So we have additional auditing and controls there, which is great because attackers need three different things. They need the credential. They need the access. They need to be able to connect to a system to leverage that credential. And then they need the rights that are associated with it. So if we can block one of those, then we can identify a way to block them, lock them out, and protect our environment in, in a better way. So PIM provides that last one where we can ensure that even if they get the credential and they get the access they can connect in, they can't do anything with it. Then they have to go through this workflow process in order to get that account into that group membership. Uh, so uh, PIM is a little arduous to get uh, configured. You go through the quick start, and then you uh, auth to it. You have to consent. Uh, you have to do something else, and then once you do that, uh, then you're in. I've provided some feedback, so hopefully that process will be a little smoother. Uh, but once you have it, then uh, there are three groups, role groups that are automatically configured under PIM. There's the security administrator, the global administrator, and the privilege roles administrators groups, uh, which are right down here. So the nice thing about this is there's some automatic controls that are put into place, and you have the workflow. So when a user wants to, or an admin wants to go into it, assuming that they're allowed to, they can automatically get elevated or added to that group. They'll be removed automatically after a specified threshold. Or they have to go through a workflow where someone actually has to go, yes, this person should be in there. So then we go to con controlling access. And I find this very interesting because the cloud is internet. It's everyone. Everyone can connect to it. Perimeter, our internal network has been very much perimeter based. You only have to have these, these certain set of uh, credentials, requirements, et cetera, to get inside. Uh, the cloud is very much moving towards a, an extension of what, we were, what we've been doing on the perimeter for a very long time, where we have security controls for the, for the perimeter and how to get into it, and yet we've had this cloud thing where everyone can connect to it. And this is where conditional access comes into play, where we can basically have an if this, then that uh, configuration. We want to make sure that uh, it, it provides amazing uh, uh, flexibility in controlling what sort of access, even down to the application level, from an IP uh, range or a specific IP for specific users or groups of users. And the nice thing about this is, using the Microsoft slide here, we have a number of different conditions that we can leverage, including risk. Um, we can require MFA for certain types of authentications as well. And so conditional access is the framework by which we can actually block legacy authentication. Microsoft says that 350,000 compromised accounts occurred in April of 2018 due to password spray, and 200,000 in the last month, which would have been August. And 100%, or just under 100% of the password spray attacks they've seen are from legacy auth. Well, yeah, probably. I ran MailSniper, and that was basically using legacy authentication. Because through legacy authentication, it's very easy to write a program, write a script, 
to interact with Office 365 and perform an authentication. With modern authentication, we're using something called ADAL, the Active Directory Authentication Libraries. It's a little more complicated, sure you could do it, but it also has capabilities such as uh, two-factor, MFA, et cetera, to, to extend and, and better protect that authentication. When we talk about legacy, we're talking about older versions of Outlook. We're talking about clients that use mail protocol, so the standard IMAP, FSMTP, and, and POP. A lot of times people forget about SMTP, but it's an important part of this as well. We can do some controls around these, but not everything, which is why blocking legacy authentication through conditional access is one of those things, one of those big security controls and the reason why people are like, I guess I have to get Azure AD Premium. And then, of course, the older PowerShell modules, et cetera. Modern Auth is default, by, uh, default within Office 20, uh, 2016 and the Outlook mobile app as well as the iOS 11 mail app. So pretty much anything where you have uh, MFA configured and it pops up and shows you that little window for MFA, that's going to be your Modern Auth uh, config. Microsoft also provides some guidance around checking to see if there's legacy authentication in your organization. Legacy is effectively what Microsoft's had, a bit, uh, had available since Office 365 first came out. And so now they're trying to clean that up and provide better, stronger authentication controls because the cloud is available to the internet at large for, for most organizations. Uh, this is a very big challenge. And as Microsoft has, has mentioned numerous times in their presentations, most attackers are leveraging this. They're leveraging uh, these mail apps, or, or at least headers of mail apps, for going in and attempting authentication so they look like they're real, so they look like it's the user using something on their Android phone or their iOS phone. So we can do this through a conditional access rule, uh, disable legacy authentication. Uh, there's a couple of uh, articles on the internet about how to do this. Uh, unfortunately, there's not a lot, which is uh, kind of discouraging. Uh, there's also not a ton of information about what the impact is. So you definitely want to make sure that you have a group that you're testing this out on. You don't want to include your executives in this group initially. Uh, you want to get a good understanding of what the impact is. And again, one of the things that really stops us at large from implementing security controls are, is the FUD, the fear, uncertainty, a doubt of what could happen. We can't turn off SMB v1 in our environment because I don't know what's going to happen. I can't get rid of NTLM v1 in my environment because I don't know what's going to happen. I can't disable legacy off because we've had Office 365 for three months and I don't know what's going to happen, right? Uh, but we need to move forward in this direction, especially if we already has, have Azure AD Premium or a P1. Uh, if we don't, this is something to definitely look at. I am truly, truly hoping that Microsoft decides at some point in the near future that the ability to disable legacy authentication is not something that should require extra money. Just that one capability. I really hope that Microsoft goes, you know what, here is a, a checkbox or an option within your subscription that says you can turn off legacy authentication and here are some controls around it. Because I think that's an important part of this. Again, the cloud is available to the internet. There are some controls that we can do. We can go through our user accounts. Sorry, I see someone's going to take a picture. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> the slides will be up on adsecurity.org later and trimarksecurity.com as well. We can go through and disable a number of these. We can disable EWS. We can disable IMAP and POP. But we can't disable SMTP. We can't disable some of these other protocols that attackers are absolutely leveraging in order to connect in. So the ability to disable legacy authentication to me it should be a foundational security control in the Microsoft Cloud. We also have some capabilities that have been added to ADFS. So in a federation environment where you have ADFS, uh, there's some better controls around what's risky IPs. Attackers are also going after federation servers. I did a talk last year at DEF CON about how to discover federation. Um, I did a scan of DNS against uh, the Fortune 1000 and very easily found pretty much every federation server uh, URL that they had available uh, just by doing a very basic scan on some typical host names. And then I could use PowerShell to connect to those web servers and get some information about what that federation system was. Once I identify what that federation system is, then I can start uh, probing for weaknesses. Um, it's, it's fairly easy to do that. And then I can also target that system for authentication. I can do password spraying against ADFS as well, which will lock out people um, on, on prem if not configured correctly. Uh, we had a customer that that happened to because they hadn't configured some of the controls around that. Uh, so let's talk about password insight. There's a couple of things that you'll definitely want to be aware of if you have Office 365 uh, and you are concerned about passwords, which I am, I, I think everyone is. 
Microsoft has Azure AD Smart Lockout, which is in public preview now, and is available for all Office 365 environments, which is great. Effectively, this goes, if we're seeing something unusual that looks like it's probably an attacker trying to authenticate as, these, as this user, we're going to have a lockout policy specific to them, but not for what we believe is actually the user. I think this is fantastic. Because there's got to be this dichotomy, this separation between, OK, I know this is probably the user, but then this over here, I'm not sure what this is. In the example I used earlier, I used a single IP address to authenticate 10 different uh, users within a minute. That's very suspicious, and that still went through by default in the cloud. So having something like this provides a better capability and some, some controls around what we really need in a cloud environment. There's also the password hash sync, which I still think is a horrible name, because it's not synchronizing the password hash. It's taking a hash of that hash and then sending that hash of the hash up to Azure AD for the users uh, that are there. Uh, there's a, at least 50 to 60%, I forget the numbers, but 50 to 60% of the Microsoft tenants uh, that are using password hash sync uh, because it provides a number of different benefits. One, if ADFS goes down or if there's a problem with it, those users can still authenticate directly to Azure AD to get into their Office 365 environment if configured appropriately. Uh, but this also provides another capability where Microsoft can check the passwords that have been, or the password hashes, hashes that have been set up to Azure AD to see if they match really bad passwords. And how they do this is they can take the list of really bad passwords hash it using the AD uh, hashing method, and then hash it using this Azure AD Connect method, which does 1,000 iterations of SHA-256 at the end to see if they match up. And if they match up, they go, these users here have really bad passwords. Please talk to them and fix this. Uh, so this is one of the big benefits that we've seen customers actually leverage password hash sync outside of the, the obvious. This is another way to auth directly to Azure AD. And now Microsoft is pulling back this capability in Azure AD Premium Password Protection. So there's a talk later on today, I believe, on this. Which definitely you want to go see it. Uh, we can now take the knowledge, experience, and expertise of Azure AD and bad passwords and which passwords should be blocked because they're horrible and pull that down to our on-prem environment. We can now have a custom ban list of words that are never allowed for a user to actually use as their, their on-prem password. It's really interesting how Microsoft's doing this, too, because effectively they're creating a new policy in Sysvol. And then it, within this, where it would normally be a group policy, it stores the information about this password policy and, and uh, otherwise. So then it synchronizes through the entire domain through Sysvol. Now, it requires DFSR, which is another challenge, I know. But uh, it's there. And so what ends up happening is when the user attempts to change their password, it goes through the standard password filter. So this agent installs a Microsoft password filter. So it probably won't crash LSAS like a lot of other password filters can. And it's going to check this password policy to see if what the user is attempting to use matches something that's very bad. And so there's about 500 known bad passwords right now that Microsoft has loaded into this list, about 500 or so. But that sounds like it's a small number. I thought it was a small number. But then what they do is they do character substitution on every one of those. And so password is also P at SS or P at 55. So it gives you over a million different types of passwords that could just be blocked. And they do this automatically through this method. So it, that provides a, a better capability where you don't need to go through this whole thing and it's like, I'm blocking this, 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 et cetera. So you configure it through Azure AD. Um, there's a configuration for it here. It's still in preview. I think GAs, they're expecting next year. But at the bottom here, um, we can say yes, and then we can toggle between audit and enforced. And there's also event IDs that we can uh, uh, look at on that. I believe so, yeah. Um, so I just talked about the architecture. I'm going to move a little more quickly through these slides here. So there's the Microsoft Security uh, Cloud Security Tune-Up. So everything needs a tune-up. Our tune-up in Office 365 is Secure Score. So a lot of people have talked about Secure Score. Microsoft has added the capability of comparing your score with other tenants of your size as well as your industry, which I really like, because then you can know how bad or good you're doing against your peers. Uh, so there's these categories and these items that are in here. This one says enable MFA for Azure AD privileged roles. Really strong, great idea. And I also like that there's compliance controls that are listed here so that you know what these map to. So as you're going through these compliance controls, you can go ahead and set some of these. Uh, there's a couple of them. I'd like to see more of these, the ability to click apply and have them automatically uh, get set. 
but you can block client rules forwarding so that users can't forward their email to their personal email, probably a good one to implement. We click, click apply, it automatically gets set. So there's been a lot of talks about Secure Score. I'm not going to bore you with all of that. But what I am going to give you is a summarization of, or a summary of what are the most important ones. So I went through all the Secure Score items, identified what the score increase or score rating was for each of them, and put in bold the ones that you absolutely want to do ASAP. And then all of the ones that required an additional subscription, I put in italics. So that way you can look at those uh, a little later to figure out what would actually be required for those. But I took the highest priority uh, scored ones at the top and then down to the ones that are, are, are least important, let's say. And Microsoft has also extended the concept of secure score to identity because identity is so important. So we're looking at identity secure score, which has some of the same elements as the standard secure score. And now there's Microsoft secure score because why not? Cloud App Security is a, another feature that you get with uh, Office 365 E5, as well as uh, one of the other tiers. So I wasn't certain about this, uh, what the benefit really was, but you can turn it on by checking this box, and you end up with this dashboard. OK, that's nice. But the thing I really like about Cloud App Security is because you can track uh, and, and provide, get better insight into the use of applications within Office 365. And so we use Teams a lot. We have partners that, that leverage our team. And so I got a notification one night that an external user was downloading a bunch of files. I didn't know this. I didn't set up any kind of alerting for this or configuration. I did nothing. Cloud App Security identified that someone who had never done this type of activity before, that was an external user, was pulling down a bunch of files. That was perfectly fine. I put them up there for him to download. But it was nice that Cloud App Security gave me that insight. And there's policies that are here for that, so that way I know exactly uh, what it's going to be looking for and what it can alert me on. And I can tune that, as well as adding additional ones. And so one of my favorite parts of Office 365 now from a security perspective is the ability to test the defenses. So if we had an abil uh, the ability to test the Death Star defenses, then we would have been able to understand a little bit more about what the problems would be there. So through Office 365, we can simulate three different types of attacks. Password spray a password attack like a brute force attack, as well as a fish. So what we do for a password spray is we pick a single password that we're going to attempt against a number of users or a group of users. And we're going to run that through. It's going to give us information about what it's doing. And when it's done, it's going to say, hey, by the way, this user here, Boba Fett, had a really bad password because that's the one you gave us. And what's cool about this is it's actually running through and running the attack. We can see this in the sign-in log within, Office 360, within our Azure AD dashboard. Uh, so we don't have to download hacking tools in order to do this. We can also run through the brute force password uh, attack, where we upload a list of passwords. My recommendation is you read any article you Google for bad passwords. Um, there's news articles that give you like 50 of the worst passwords. Copy those into a text file, take that text file, upload it to here, run it against all your users. When you do it this way, it's not actually going to tell you what their password was. It's just going to say, these are the people that have really bad passwords. You probably need to talk to them. And then you can draft a very simple email that says, your password has been identified as one of those that is widely known as a really bad password. Please change it to something better. And don't just add a number to the end of it. There's also the ability to, to perform a phishing attack against your users. And there's a template here. So I picked uh, payroll update. Uh, we can configure some of the options here. It's not the best template in the world, but it's a starting point. So if you don't have a lot of money to hire a company to fish you or hire a service, you can do this yourself. Go through, select it, change some of the graphics, customize it a little bit, and then run it against a list of users. Um, you can name the different campaigns to see what, what it is. But the thing I like about it is it pops up and it says, urgent, update your payroll details. OK, that sounds important. So I go ahead and look at this. And I see that Outlook has identified this as something that maybe it shouldn't display all the images. So I go through and say, yes, display all the images, click on the link. It gives me a sign in. I go, ooh, I don't want to do that. Shouldn't it automatically sign me in? And then it's got this really weird URL at the top, so I probably shouldn't do that. Meanwhile, I had another user that was like, I'm going to type in my credentials. So uh, Microsoft says here that, hey, this connection is not secure because this, this fish here is not using HTTPS. And the password that I put in would not be secured as well. And then at the end, if, once I type this in, I get redirected to a, a, a standard message uh, website that Microsoft has that says, you've been fished. You probably want to do something better about this. Redirect this to your own one so that's internal. Redirect them to um, training that they need to go through. 
And then there's this really nice report here about what they need to do. Uh, so I have some slides here on subscriptions, capability, and costs. I'm just going to breeze through these real quick. Uh, let's go to here. As mentioned before, it is a bit pricey to go with Azure ADP1 to get conditional access, $6 per user monthly. Uh, to get PIM, it's $9 per user monthly. These are all rack rates right off the Microsoft website. You can do better uh, by talking to Microsoft, talking to the resellers. You can also get Azure AD with the enterprise mobility and security options, which gave, uh, provide additional capabilities. But what does this boil down to? These are what the costs look like. So E3 plus Azure AD P1, so what most organizations are really going to have, $26 a month, um, because the Azure AD P1 is going to bump it up by $6. This is another reason why I think that legacy uh, authentication blocks should be included with the subscription, because $6 extra per user per month out of a $20 cost that they're already doing is pretty heavy for a lot of customers, a lot of organizations. Meanwhile, there's others that are like, $50 a month at the bottom, sign me up, I'm in. Give me all that security. So I have a number of best practices that I've summarized here. Um, thank you for the joke. Getting the joke, I appreciate it. Uh, it's a challenge. It is a real challenge to have uh, cloud security. And so this is meant to be a diving off point and, and jumping off into all these different areas. There's a number of recommendations that Microsoft has that we have. I've summarized them here. I'm not going to go through them because I don't have time. Uh, but we had some great discussions, so I much prefer having the discussions and recapping my, my slide deck with, with these slides and talking about them. But the slides will be online shortly, and um, thank you very much. The cloud is inherently secure, but there are elements that we need to do to ensure that we improve the security of the cloud. That's been my time. Thanks so much for yours.